Entrepreneurs Over 40, Episode 2, featuring Aaron Walker talking about masterminds. I don't believe we're designed to be alone because I think isolation is the enemy to excellence. And if you really want to go forward in life, you've got to have a strong community around you. You've got to have people that are willing to complement your superpowers, but also throw the flag on your blind spot. You're listening to Entrepreneurs Over 40, the show for somewhat mature entrepreneurs and side hustlers. And now your host, Greg Mills. Our guest today is a veteran entrepreneur that started his first of 14 businesses at 18 years old. He sold to a Fortune 500 company at age 27 for well over $1 million. Since then, he started, bought, and sold 13 successful companies over the past 36 years. A strong desire for personal development has kept him in a weekly mastermind group for more than a decade. He retired at age 50 and was encouraged to become a coach by Dan Miller and Dave Ramsey, so he started Iron Sharpens Iron, a mastermind program to help men find success and significance in their businesses and personal lives. He also has authored several books on Amazon, including View from the Top, Living a Life of Significance, and The Mastermind Blueprint, Building a Rich Life. He's been married to his lovely wife, Robin, for over 40 years and has two fantastic daughters and five beautiful grandchildren. Without further ado, Aaron Walker. Hey, Greg. Thanks for having me on, man. I've got to live up to that introduction. I'm not sure I can do that, but I'm going to give it a shot, man. Thanks for having me as your guest. Uh, it's my pleasure, and you've already lived up to the introduction. Yeah, you've already you've already done the work, so. Well, I appreciate it, buddy. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I'm excited to be here today. Can you take a few moments and fill in the gaps from that intro and bring us up to speed with what's going on in your world today? I would love to do that. I'll try not to make this too boring. I'll go back just a little bit. Uh, I'm a native Nashvilleian. I've been in Tennessee for 60 years this year. We're three generations deep, so I'm pretty grounded here. People tell me all the time, man, where would you live if you could live anywhere you want? I said, I can live anywhere I want, and I do. I live in Nashville, Tennessee. It's the hub of the universe right here. I love it in Nashville. My two daughters, Brooke and Holly, live about five minutes from me, so I get to see my grandkids every day. That's a lot of fun. Robin and I next month will celebrate our 41st wedding anniversary. You've already touched on a little bit of that. I uh, started out early at 18, starting my first business, sold to a Fortune 500 when I was 27. That allowed me to do some pretty cool stuff along the way. And uh, you've already stated it in the opening remarks. Uh, Dan Miller and Dave Ramsey have been friends of mine for a couple of decades now. They suggested that I start coaching, at which I didn't want to do, Greg. I said, I don't want any part of that. I said, I'm tired. I've been working since I was eight years old. I'm 50 now. I'm ready to retire. And Dan Miller come across the table on me. He said, man, you've got to work. He said, you're too young to stop working. And I want to see you encourage and coach some of these other young folks, entrepreneurs. And so I started doing that. And, uh, you know, I'm a Christian by faith and Christians pray about everything. And I told Dan Miller and Dave, I would have to pray through this. And I did. The Lord wouldn't let me up. He said, no, you've got to coach. And so I started coaching and started doing podcast interviews. I didn't even know what a podcast was eight years ago, but I started doing podcast interviews and man, the floodgates have just opened up. We've got 20 mastermind groups now. Uh, we've got uh, members from eight or nine different countries from around the world. And we're just helping people uh, excel in every area of their life. And we primarily focus on professional, personal, and spiritual development. So, Greg, I'm just having fun doing that today, each and every day. That's a blessing to be able to do what you what you enjoy and to help others while doing it. Well, I appreciate it. I do consider it a huge blessing that I get to help people develop in those areas and help them have transformational experience. It, it, it's a lot of fun. So you hit on the fact that you've been working almost all of your life. What was your first job? Yeah, my dad uh, told me if I wanted to make some money, I had to get a job. <laughs> he said, because we're not going to give you any money. Primarily, I think it's because they didn't have any to give me. I was a real poor kid when I was young and started working at the bread box. It was a little drive-in market down the street from my house, stocking shelves and 
My next job was uh, with a guy that had a meat market route, and he would go around on Saturdays and deliver hamburgers and steaks to people's houses, and I helped him with that. When I was 10 years old, I built a little route of cutting yards in our community. And then when I was 13 years old, I started working for my dad in the construction industry. And I learned real quick, I didn't want to do much of that. I was like, my goodness, I've got to do something besides this. And then I took a job at a local pawn shop, and that's where my whole life changed. I was 13 years old. When I was 15 years old, I decided that's what I wanted to do professionally. And I started the process at 15 years old to get that up and going. When I was 18, we launched our first pawn shop. So I spent 27 years in the pawn shop industry. Wow, that is amazing. Now, did anybody in your family besides your dad have an entrepreneurial background? Or oh, yeah. They were all entrepreneurs, but none of them were any good. <laughs> no, nobody, you know, nobody. We were all too stubborn to work for somebody else. So we just worked for ourselves. And my grandfather did pretty good. My uncle did pretty good. Uh, my dad didn't do so well. He wanted to hunt and fish. And uh, he was a man of character and integrity, but he didn't care anything about making money. Uh, I've got two brothers that are entrepreneurs, a sister that's an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, I've never worked for anybody since I was 18 years old, and I've always just kind of done my own thing. And I felt like if I was going to be uh, in charge of my schedule, uh, I needed to work for myself. So that's what I started doing when I was 18. Man, that's amazing that you've never worked for anybody else. I told somebody that the other day. I said, I'm 60 years old. And since I was 18, I've never had a paycheck. What's a quote that's really made a difference in your life and helped kind of set you up for success? You know, my mom had a little saying when I was a kid. I don't know if this is what you're referring to, but she would say, can't, couldn't do it, and could, did it all. And I was like, what in the world does that mean? And she said, well, if you think you can't, you probably won't. And so she would always say, you can't use the word can't. And I'm like, well, you just used it in the explanation. And she said, well, you're not going to use it. She said, you may not be able to make it happen, but you're at least going to try. And so for that reason, it built a lot of self-esteem. It built a lot of self-confidence in me as a child. And today it's one of my core values, no excuses. And I don't allow people in our organization to have excuses like my next core value is everything's figure outable. Like we'll figure it out. And so when you develop that mindset of you can do it and you don't have any excuses and you've developed the strategy that everything is figure outable, you're probably going to end up successful. So we just adopted that over four decades ago and it's worked out pretty well for us. It sounds like your parents, while they may not have been financially successful, they really set you up well with what they oh, taught there's you. no doubt man my mom and dad had a work ethic that was unbelievable and my mom had a very positive mindset and she was like hey boy if you're gonna make it you got to get out there and get after it and so there wasn't any of this sitting around watching video tube i tubes and all that stuff, whatever you call it all day long it was get your butt off the couch and go get to work and so yeah they developed a lot of strong work ethics in us so in Proverbs twenty seven seventeen, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So why the name iron sharpens iron for your mastermind? Well, you know, as I said earlier, I'm a believer and uh, I believe that we're designed to be in community. I don't believe we're designed to be alone because I think isolation is the enemy to excellence. And if you really want to go forward in life, you've got to have a strong community around you. You've got to have people that are willing to complement your superpowers, but also throw the flag on your blind spot. And I want people around me, Greg, that'll call me out. People that'll say, no, you can't treat her that way. Or if you don't come home a little earlier, somebody else is going to take your kids to baseball practice. And then when you get old and rich, you're not going to have any relationships and I just need people around me to remind me of that stuff occasionally. And I want to excel. I want to do good. I don't want to be average, you know, because if you're average, you're just as close to the bottom as you are at the top. And I don't want to live that kind of life. I want to live a life full of adventure. I want to be able to make a little bit of money. I want to be able to take my family on trips. Uh, I want to be able to give money away. I want to be able to help people. And you can't do that just sitting on the couch at home watching reruns of Andy Griffith. You know, we got to get out and get after it. And so I think that if you get into a mastermind group, 
listen, nothing worth having is worth having if some sparks are not flying. And that's the reason iron sharpening iron, we're there to help one another. And if we can't help one another, it's like, I don't know what your purpose is. And so people only remember how you make them feel. And if you don't get in the trenches with them and really propel them to the next level, uh, for me, that's not much of a relationship. So Proverbs 27, 17 kind of rose to the top. And I said, it's going to be iron sharpens iron. That's a great name for it. So, you know, you hit on it a little bit, but how has being in a mastermind changed your life and the lives of your fellow participants? Yeah. Well, as I said earlier, we weren't designed to live this journey alone and we've got to have people around us. And if you're not in a mastermind, how can anybody give you advice? And the reason is, is because they don't know you. They don't know your spouse. They don't know your kids. They don't know your propensity to do certain things. They don't know your dreams. They don't know your aspirations. They don't know your goals. Uh, how in the world is anybody going to give you advice if they don't know the answers to all those questions? So when you get in a mastermind, you let the veil down, you let the facade down and you say, Hey, here I am the good, the bad, the ugly, like you're getting it all right here. I'm vulnerable. I'm transparent. I'm going to be authentic. And that's when we start building on a solid foundation. But here's what happens. We all got this facade up. We all got, uh, everybody thinks everything's rainbow and sunshines in your life. And that's just not reality. We all have trials and you'll have relationship problems. Listen, Robin and I've had mountaintops. We wouldn't know we had mountaintops if we didn't have valleys. And so you live a life with somebody four decades, you're going to kind of get tired of them occasionally. And they're going to maybe get, get all up in your face. And then you're going to say something you shouldn't. Then you got to apologize. And I need people to help me go big. A. you can't do that. You can't say those kind of things. And you need to be home when your children are there because you only get one go through with them. I mean, you don't get a second chance. It's like, I don't want to have regrets. I don't want to lay there on my deathbed one of these days and go, you know, I should have paid attention. I should have been at home more. Nobody says I should have been at the office more, but yet people just spend the majority of their time there. They don't really prioritize their family. And then you come home one day with a pocket full of money to a house full of strangers and you wonder why they don't have anything to do with you. And I need people in my corner occasionally reminding me of that. So I just spent, the past 21 years every week in a mastermind group. And it's really helped propel me to a level of success that I wouldn't have had alone. You know, as a man, I think we're conditioned to, to at least think that we have to be the lone ranger, that we have to solve everything by ourselves and mm. relying on other people is weak. And as you get older, you know, you find out that that's just you know utter nonsense. Yeah, well, the thing is, is that ego and pride slips in and you think, hey, I'm a man. I can do it all on my own. Well, there's no self-made people out there. Uh, it takes community. It takes great colleagues. It takes team members. It takes a tribe to raise a family. Why wouldn't it take a tribe to keep you on the straight and narrow to run your life and run your business? And um uh, but people think that if they are vulnerable and transparent, they'll appear weak. And the truth is, is you'll be stronger as a result of it. So masterminds give you a new perspective. Like, Greg, you have one life experience. You have one set of filters. Uh, you don't have a different perspective. You can't see it differently if you wanted to. And we need people in our corner that can point out things that we can't see. And when we have the consensus of the multitudes, more than likely, that's probably going to work out but you've got to subject yourself to the scrutiny of a group of people that are willing to throw the flag on you, willing to call you out, willing to give you constructive criticism. I mean, my goodness, I even send out letters to people saying, how do you see me in this light? How do you see me acting around my family? How do you see me out in public? Like, help me. I want to get better. And uh, I just tell me, hit me on the chin. You know, I can take it. And just tell me the truth, because I can't fix something if I don't know it's broke. Now, I imagine your wife's pretty conditioned to, to that now. But what was her reaction the first first time that she she realized that you were doing that? Well, you know, we uh, we got married two weeks out of high school, Greg. So we kind of raised each other. So we've been together, you know, the vast majority of our life. And she's not known it any other way except for me to be this way. But the truth is. The, the world we're living in today is starving to death for authenticity. 
We're so mm-hmm. tired of the polished persona and living on the beach in Hawaii and the four hour work week. And, you know, uh, no disrespect to that book. It was a great book, but his intention was not for people to literally take it to that extreme. And we've lost all sense of our bearings and we need people to walk around us and help us grind it out and have that grit and determination and perseverance and really set these aspirational goals that we can accomplish the things that we need to, to help us stay on the straight and narrow, to help us prioritize our priorities and help us accomplish the things in life that really matter. You know, my first number one core value is relationships matter most. And if people don't matter to you, you go have a long road ahead of you because you're dealing with people regardless of what you're dealing with. And when you really focus outward and you're the giver and not the taker, that natural reciprocity, it comes back to you a hundred X. And so when you really focus on other people and help them accomplish their goals and dreams, man, you'll get anything you want out of life. You just got to be genuine and you got to go out there and really help. people. Now, what about for the person that joins your mastermind or any mastermind for that matter? And they're, they're, they're going by the uh, old adage, well, better not to open my mouth and have them think I'm a fool. Well, yeah, I've heard that before. It says it's better to appear stupid than to open your mouth and relieve all doubt. But the, the truth is, is none of us have it all figured out. Now, we can't go out there to the general populace that has no context to your situation and air your dirty laundry. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. What I'm suggesting is, is you go into an accountability group or a mastermind group where people are genuinely interested in your well-being people that align with your core values, people that align with having a purpose in life, people that really want to excel personally, professionally, and spiritually. I want people around me that are really interested in doing life the correct way. And we've got to have some straight edge by which we determine what it is for you that is based on truth. And my final core value is truth before opinion. And for me, God's word is truth, and I measure everything against it. And if it doesn't coincide with that, then I'm out. I'm not interested. I can hear other perspectives. I can understand. I can regard you for who you are and who you stand for. But at the end of the day, we've got to have some value system that we measure everything that we do in our life. And so when you get around people, they say you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I think Jim Rohn Uh, is noted for that quote, but it's true. If you really want to excel, you really want to go to new heights, you've got to get around people that have the capability or the probability of getting there. If not, you know, you're just going to kind of hang out where you're at and you're not going to really up level. You're not going to push through upper limit challenges. Uh, You're going to be comfortable where you're at. And procrastination kicks in and then you look up one day and here you are 65, 70 years old and you finally discover that you really didn't uh, meet your own expectations and you didn't really do the things that you're capable of doing. And I just want to be pushed to that level. So how do you attract and vet the people for your mastermind groups just to make sure that they're the right fit? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, uh, I've done a number of podcast interviews over the years and a lot of people hear me and they say, Hey, I want to know more about that. There's an application that we take, uh, that applications at viewfromthetop.com, And we vet each and every person we go through and have an interview, just like you and I are talking now. And it lasts about 40 minutes historically. And I ask some very pointed, uh, very direct questions about you and your goals and what it is that you've accomplished, what you hope to accomplish, some of your personal values, what your mission statement is, where you want to be in life. And then we say, hey, this is who we are as an organization. We really go through and we make the member promise. We say, hey, this is what you can expect from us. But at the same time, this is what we expect from you. We want you to show up on the calls. We want you to show all your cards We want you to help other people connect with other people. We want you to call them out, walk with them, connect offline. Uh, We really want you to build that camaraderie, build that uh, type of sense of rapport that you would have with somebody that really wants to form that relationship. And once we establish you're in, uh, then we just continue to grow our community. 
Now, are most of these virtual? They're all virtual. Yeah. Okay. We, we, we've got members in about eight or nine different countries now. And you know, what's pretty cool is, is that we found out that people will be more vulnerable and transparent with people that they first meet virtually. They wouldn't do it in person because they're worried about my bankers in the room, you know, my chiropractors in there our preachers in there and our wives play tennis together or they're at the country club together or, you know, man's wife cleans my teeth. My wife may hear this. And it's like, oh, they're scared. They're locked up. And so virtually that's not a problem. And then the other thing is, is you can get such high quality people because you're not limiting it to your geographic area. Okay. Now, one of my first thoughts, and and now I'm kind of rethinking this, was like, this would be a perfect ministry for your church or for any other church. But for the reasons you just described, you know, people might not be as open to sharing or you know talking about their individual struggles as they might be you know in a Zoom type forum. Yeah. Well, Greg, let's talk about that because you might have opened up Pandora's box for a minute. But I've been a leader in my church uh, for decades, literally three and a half decades. I love our church. I mean, I love our pastor. Uh, it's amazing. But the truth of the matter is we really get off more in your business in the mastermind groups than we do at church. Uh, we ask very, very personal questions. I'm challenged and uh, I'm asked things to uh, uh, that, that I just don't get asked on a regular basis in our church. And I had this discussion recently with our pastor. I said, why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we in each other's business and ask them about various things that are causing them and creating problems in their life? Why aren't we calling them out? Why aren't we saying you can't do that? You need to be at home at this time. You need to be around your kids. You don't need to be looking at pornography. You need to be treating your wife with respect. Like, why are we doing that? And I just, for the love of me, don't understand why we're not doing it. But we do that in the mastermind. Like, don't ever join my mastermind if you're thick, if you're thin skinned. I mean, if you can't take it on the chin, you don't need to be in our group because we're about getting it done. We're about moving the needle. We move the ball down the field. And when you say I'm going to do something and you don't, you get called out. And at church, we hide. You know, we don't even tell. Nobody asks, nobody tells. And I'm like, man. How are we going to get better if we're not doing this stuff? And so no disrespect to the majority of our churches, but we're doing what church should be doing. I think the majority of the churches are just trying to survive, and they probably think that, you know, if I ask the hard questions, that'll drive people off. But it's I think the opposite. It, it is. They're failing because they're not asking the hard questions. If they would get in there and be life transformational for people, they would want to come and uh, yeah. So I think if that's the mindset, we got it backwards. So how long does the average membership in a mastermind last versus, you know, one of your masterminds? You know, I hear, I don't know this. I can't support it. Uh, statistically, I can just tell you kind of the word of mouth historically less than a year in most masterminds. We do have the analytics to support what we've done, and we've had hundreds and hundreds of people go through our mastermind program. 3.2 years is the average life of one of our members, and we've had dozens and dozens and dozens stay six and seven years in our mastermind group. Because Why would they not want to stay? I mean, their, their, their marriage is better. They're better dads. We have a women's group as well. They're better wives. They're better moms. Their businesses are doubling and tripling. Uh, they're, they're walking the way they should be walking in regards to personal and professional and spiritual in every area of their life. Why would they want to get out when they're getting that kind of return? And so it just doesn't make sense. And that's why they stay so long. We really have a great program here. It's really something that, uh, your, your audience should check out. Now you mentioned that you have masterminds for, for women. We do. Are they co-ed or are they? No, they're all? not. No, okay. they're women, women are run by my daughter, Brooke. Brooke is the director, and we have facilitators that run those groups. And uh, co-ed groups can be fine, but the truth is I'm just old school. 
there's some things I need to be talking about with men that I wouldn't feel comfortable doing with women in there. And there again, I'm from the old school. I know a lot of people say that's ridiculous. Well, it's just the way I am. You know what I'm saying? And there's things that women need to be talking about that the men doesn't need to be in there. And you and I are similar in age and you're kind of from the old school too. So you can appreciate what I'm talking about, but uh, I just feel it's best. There's many masterminds that are hugely successful that are co-ed. And if that's for you, that's fine. The other thing is, is I've done a lot of financial counseling over the years. You know, Dave Ramsey and I've been best friends for almost 30 years. So I kind of grew up, you know, in uh, him growing that radio business. And I was his uh, second sponsor. I sponsored his show for 21 consecutive years. And so I grew up kind of around that. And my wife used to say, why do you make the women cry? And I started laughing. I said, I don't mean to make them cry. It's just that I say it. I say whatever it is. And so I do that with men. Like I can't help you if I don't just say it. And if you don't say it to me, like you liking me is good, but my main priority is to make you better. And if you like me, it's a benefit, right? It's a plus, but our objective is for you to get better. And just sometimes I get a little carried away myself and uh, we felt it was better if the women had a director and they run their groups and then the men, we run our groups. Yeah, I can't imagine being in a, a man being in a group and asking a question, you know, how should I proceed with my wife or something even more personal? And sure, you know, that, that would just seem to like it would inhibit the it responses. Would. And it does. And so, you know, I wouldn't want my wife in there talking about real personal things in front of other women related to our relationship. And we found that to be true. There are a few outliers that are okay with it, and that's fine. There's groups out there for you. It's just not so happened to be our group. So you touched on this a little bit. I I was going to ask anyway, how involved is your family in View from the Top and Iron Sharpens Iron? Yeah, well, our daughter, Brooke, is the chief operating officer for our company. So that's pretty involved. Uh, Everything runs across her desk. Uh, She does an amazing job. Uh, My wife and I elect not to participate in business because when I leave and turn the light out in my office, you know, we need to have our family time and we need to leave the business uh, as much as I can at, at the business. And then we need to have our family. We did try during one of our companies. We used to own a construction company and Robin worked in the company. And uh, that didn't work out too well because she let me know in so many words she didn't work for me. (laughs) And I'm used to getting it done. And she didn't like the way I was throwing out some of the commands. And she said, I said, you know what, Robin, it'd probably be best we didn't work together because you know me, I'm a hard charger. I'm pedal to the metal. I got to get it done. And so we just elected at that time that we probably shouldn't work together. Why are mastermind groups a good add-on for online businesses? Yeah, that's a great question, Greg. We have a lot of people ask us that question. Uh, You know, when I first started coaching, I didn't really have uh, the desire to start masterminds. But when I started doing podcast interviews, man, people started coming out of the woodwork. And I said, goodness gracious, there's no way I can coach all these people. And I've been in a mastermind and it was successful. And I said, well, I'll, I'll do one group. So I did kept doing podcast interviews, kept filling up groups. And I'm like, good night. What am I going to do? Well, I just kept adding groups. And then all of a sudden thought leaders from around the world started noticing we were scaling mastermind groups. And I had a guy call me from Dubai and he said, big A, he said, how are you scaling these mastermind groups? And I told him, he said, would you coach me to do that? I said, no, I don't want to do that. I said, I'll take too much time. I don't really want to do it. He said, just name a price. And I was going to name a price to get rid of him. And I threw a big number out there to run him off. He said, where do I send the money? I said, what? He said, where do I send the money? I said, are you serious? He said, yeah, man, you're killing it. And I want to do the same thing. So he sent me the money and I coached him. And another guy called, said the same thing. I tried the same tactic. I said, hey, I don't want to do it. And he said, how much? And I named the price. And he said, where do I send the money? And I'm like, dang. So my daughter came in my office one day and she said, dad, these people are really taking notice of how we're building the uh, masterminds. We should create a playbook. I said, I don't want to do that, Brooke. I said, that'll take too much time and it'll take a lot of effort and energy on our team. And she said, well, what do you want to do? Do you really want to 
scale and keep growing? Or do you want to teach other people to do it? They can continue to do it. And she guilted me into it. And I said, okay. So we created the mastermind playbook where all the systems and processes are in one playbook. And then we developed a coaching program to teach people to do exactly what we're doing. So we've got people now all over the world that are implementing our strategy and we've created a framework and a playbook in order to teach other people what we're doing and what people have discovered. An average cost of a mastermind is about $500 a month. There's some that are way more and there's a lot that are way less, but let's just use the average of $500. If you have two groups, that's 20 people because we put 10 in a group. Well, if you do some quick math, that's $120,000 a year. If you lead two groups, each group takes about three hours a week. So an hour to lead the call, about an hour to get ready, about an hour to follow up. So now you got six hours a week invested in a six figure business. Now, Greg, I don't know about you, but the way I do math, that's pretty good ROI for your time. And you only need 20 people to do that. Well, here we are, you know, with a couple of hundred people in these mastermind groups. And I didn't anticipate a seven figure business that I'm involved in seven of the groups, but the remainder of the groups, I have facilitators that we do revenue share with. So I'm making money on all these groups and I'm not even in the group because I've built the framework. And so you ask a great question. Why would you want to do this as an add on? I don't know about you, but if you invest six hours a week and you can pick up an extra six figures, that's a pretty good add-on. Well, not only that, you're doing it, I think, for more altruistic reasons too. Yeah, it's the transformational experience, right? And so we get to participate in that. And then also the revenue is nice as well. So I don't want to, I hate it when people with money go, money's not important. I want to go, you liar. It's real important. Let's take it away from you and see how important it is. Yeah. It's very important, but it needs to be a tool. It doesn't need to be your God. It doesn't need to be the sole reason that you're doing anything. But listen, we all got bills to pay. We, we got, I like to eat. You know, I formed this bad habit. And then I like to go on trips and I like to give money away. And in order to do those things, you got to make a living. And so we're just teaching people how to do this all across the world right now. And it's really working well for them, Greg. Thank you for asking. Now, you mentioned transformations. Are there any, you know, specific examples you can give without, you know, obviously identifying somebody? Yeah. But, you know, anything that you'd be comfortable sharing? Yeah, man, I could talk the rest of the afternoon and all day tomorrow, you know, on the transformational experiences. But what we find is, is that people primarily are isolated. They, they trying to figure it out on their own and they're at home and they try this and they try that. Well, you can only try so many things because you don't know what you don't know. And when you get around a group of people that are like-minded that really want to grow, it just opens up so many opportunities. You just have new perspective and new insights. And these people are getting in now and they're like, man, I didn't even know to think that way. And they make one or two small alterations in their business and then they just grow exponentially. Well, it's not that they're dumb. They were just ignorant. They just didn't know that they could make those changes. Or people are like, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Dan Sullivan's book, uh, Dr. Benjamin Hardy actually wrote, it's called Who Not How. And everybody's always trying to figure out how. Well, the truth of the matter is you don't need to know how, you need to know who. And that's how you're going to really grow your business. Well, People in the mastermind are like, I didn't know to know that. I didn't know to think about getting a who rather than trying to figure it out on my own. And so we do a program called Come As You Will Be in 2023 to where you set aspirational goals in five key areas of your life. And usually after about the first year, people are redoing their goals because they've already accomplished their three-year goal because we help you really get focused. And so there are so many personal and professional transformations that are going on. Just think about when you're in a group every single week for an hour and you tell people what you're going to do and you have to report back the following week. Well, there's no more procrastination. You don't kick the can down the road. You do the thing. And when you do the thing, you know what happens? You're successful. And as a result of that constant accountability, there's going to be huge transformation in your life. And then when you go home 
and you continue to work and little Billy wants to throw baseball, but you're like, I got to send 10 more emails. He goes to bed, you finish your emails and you pass out and you get up and you go to work the next morning before he gets out of bed. You don't even know your son. And then somebody else takes your little girl to piano recital and you're like, honey, was it good? Yeah, it was good. Daddy, I wish you'd been there. And it's like, well, see, but when you're in our group, we hold you accountable to being at home at a proper time. And we want you to stop emailing and go out and pitch baseball with Billy and go to the piano recital. And that wife that you've taken advantage of for 20 years and she's been patient, you're like, hey, she'll only be patient so long. You'll come home one day and find your luggage out on the front porch. And you're like, man, I never saw that coming. Well, you'd see it coming if you were paying attention. And so that's what we help people do. So, Greg, that's just a few very broad um, transformations that happen, but there's very specific uh, transformations that happen all along the way. Okay. So, you know, it sounds like a lot of it, it parallels coaching. Uh, what do you see as the primary difference? Yeah, there's a little bit of difference. Some people that are unfamiliar with masterminds will compare it to group coaching. Group coaching, Greg, and you're a great group coach. You stand up and you do a dissertation. Everybody's looking at Greg for the answer. In masterminds, we're in masterminds, we're all equal. We have a facilitator that keeps us on track to make sure we get through what we've scheduled to do, but everybody is sharing equal. And so that's the difference in group coaching. Uh, it'd be like you inviting me to your house and Mrs. Mills opens the door and I come in and sit down at the table with five other couples. And we look at the head of the table and there's Greg. And every time somebody poses a question, Greg answers the question. That would be a pretty boring evening. No disrespect, but that would be pretty boring. But when somebody throws out a question and everybody around the table gets an opportunity to share their perspective, it's a lot more interesting and you're going to get a lot more wisdom. And so that's what masterminding is. It's trusted advisors that don't have anything to gain or lose. It's kind of like having your own board of directors. Okay. Do you ever have someone that's just not a good fit and you just have to ask them to leave? Absolutely. And we, and we do ask people to leave and we ask people to leave that don't show up on the calls, that don't do the accountability tool, that don't share, that don't encourage, that don't throw the flag occasionally. We say, Hey, this is not for you, right? It's just not for you. Or we'll get people in that really need, uh, maybe a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Maybe they need one-on-one -on -one help prior to the mastermind. And so, you know, we're, we're not about doing work that a psychologist is trained and educated to do, but we are about the consensus of the multitude, but there are people at different levels. And so for various reasons, oftentimes a person's not a good fit and we're quick to point that out. Okay. Switching gears just a little bit. Now, what do you consider, you know, some of the best business books that you've read and why? Oh, man, there's so many amazing books out there. I think I mentioned earlier, Who Not How. Uh, Dan Sullivan really did a good job with that. Business on Purpose is another really good book uh, that I would recommend highly. You know, as a matter of fact, if uh, you want to go to our website, View from the Top, there's a book recommendation reading list there. Okay. Uh, Thou Shalt Prosper is a really good book. Rabbi Daniel Lappin wrote that book. I recommend it. If you're looking for a Really good book on uh, negotiating from a business standpoint, not in a used car salesman type negotiating, but Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss is a really, really good book. Essentialism by Greg McEwen is a really good book. Uh, Turn the Ship Around is another great book. So go to our website, viewfromthetop.com, and uh, you can get our list of books that we recommend for business. Now, I understand that you're working on several new books. So what are the, top, yeah, are the that, topics uh, of those going to be? Thank you. I wasn't expecting you to mention that. Uh, Seth Buekley uh, wrote a book called Ambition, and he is in our mastermind group. He owns a company called Cathedral Consulting. They're out in Oregon, and he and I are partnering up. We're going to be writing two books. One is Who is My Mentor? And the other one is How to Be a Mentor. And so I think we all need mentors. We need to reach back and we need to reach forward. And we're going to teach people how to do that. Yeah, I think there's a just a huge need for mentors today. And, you know, 
unfortunately, people seem to be, a lot of people seem to be wrapped up and not have the time to do it or not be willing to do it. Yeah. I think it's the latter, not the former. I think most people are not willing to do it. We have the time to do whatever we want if we're willing to allocate the time to do it. Yeah. It's just trying to make, make time to right. you know prioritize. That's it. Go ahead and we'll wrap this up here. What's the number one piece of advice that you can give for our listeners? I would just say fear missing an opportunity more than you fear failure and keep an open mindset of how you can do something, not how you can't. And I think you'll live a very successful and significant life. And what's the best way for people to check you out and get in touch with you? Yeah, thank you, Greg. Uh, viewfromthetop.com is the easiest and best way. All of our social media platforms are there, and I would love to engage with you. All right. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you, Aaron, for being a guest on Entrepreneurs Over 40. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Greg. Some of my key takeaways from our conversation with Aaron Walker were his mom's quote of, can't, couldn't do it, and could did it all. It was just a very empowering quote that she taught him that we could all use. He also discussed the value of being in a mastermind where people get real and help each other out and, and themselves. Said so that the world is starving for authenticity. Said so that when you focus on other people and help them accomplish their goals and dreams, you'll get almost anything you want out of life. He also mentioned that masterminds are a great fit for online communities. Be sure to check us out next week where we interview Stephen Key of InventRight, where he talks about product development. Thank you for listening to Entrepreneurs Over 40. Check us out at entrepreneursover40.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast directory.